Tonight, a distressing decision for a Canadian mother stuck in Syria with her children bound for Canada. A bureaucratic holdup. She's not getting the reassurance that she'd like to get from her government. The agonizing challenge in repatriating citizens from detention camps. Donald Trump not planning to go quietly. He's gearing up for a, a battle. The former U.S. president set to go on the offense as he prepares his defense against unprecedented criminal charges. Plus, a standout Canadian swimmer making waves. Just being able to say you're a Paralympian, it's really like a title everyone wants and it's really hard to get. Defying the odds on his quest for the top. CTV National News with Sandy Ronaldo. Reporting tonight, Heather Wright. Good evening, six Canadian children are set to leave a Syrian prison camp and fly to Canada without their mother. Advocates for the Quebec woman say the family is being separated because federal officials have not yet completed her security assessment. The Al Raj detention camp in northeastern Syria was set up to hold suspected ISIS militants and supporters of the terrorist group. But Canada's responsibility to repatriate citizens in prison there is being tested. CTV's Judy Trin explains. These are the children of a Quebec woman currently detained in northeast Syria. Two girls, four boys. The youngest is five years old, the oldest, 14. They have been languishing in these conditions since 2018. Now their path to return home together appears blocked. What she has been told in the last few days is that the children are eligible for repatriation but that her assessment hasn't been completed yet, so she's expected to stay in the detention camp. Last November, Global Affairs notified the 38-year-old woman that her family qualified for repatriation because of deteriorating conditions in the camp and threats to her children's safety. She was told officials had initiated assessments. Similar letters were sent to 26 Canadian women and children, including a group who sued in federal court to get repatriation. The Quebec woman wasn't part of that initial court case, and four months after getting the letter, her security assessment hasn't been completed. It's completely unacceptable, and it's contrary to the policy framework that Global Affairs Canada has themselves, which says, thou shalt not separate mother from child. Advocates say the woman's husband is missing, as she doesn't have relatives in Canada. When the children return to Quebec, they will be put in foster care. A flight out is expected any day. Her primary impulse, I think it's to get them out of harm's way the best that she can. I think she's not getting the reassurance that she'd like to get from her government that they will eventually bring her home. Just days earlier, foreign mothers of Canadian children were issued an ultimatum by the federal government. Give up guardianship of your children to get them to Canada. Unlike the Quebec mother, those women did not surrender care of their kids. Heather. Judy Trin in Ottawa. Thanks, Judy. An explosion tore through a cafe in Russia's second largest city today, killing a well-known military blogger and strident supporter of the war in Ukraine. A security camera captured the blast that killed Vladlin Tatarsky and injured 30 others. It happened just moments after a woman presented Tatarsky with a small figurine believed to have contained explosives. Tatarsky, whose real name was Maxim Foman, once threatened that Russia would beat everyone, kill everyone and rob everyone. Tonight, support for the American journalist detained in Russia and demands for his release are growing louder. In a rare phone call, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken spoke to his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, to push for the immediate release of Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich and American Paul Whelan, both accused of espionage. WNBA star Brittany Griner, who was detained in Russia for 10 months, also weighed in, posting this message calling for the detained Americans to be brought home. The death toll from the devastating tornado outbreak that tore across the Midwest and southern United States is rising, with more than 30 people confirmed dead. As millions of Americans clean up, nearly 100 possible tornadoes are believed to have touched down from Iowa to New Jersey. 
Today, President Biden declared a major disaster in Arkansas. In Belvedere, Illinois, people gathered to remember the man who died when the roof of this theater collapsed during a concert, his son describing his final moments. I couldn't see. <laughs> Yeah, so fast, man. Tonight, there are threats of new storms with parts of Texas and Oklahoma under a tornado watch. And a political storm is brewing across the United States tonight as the country braces for an historically consequential and controversial week. Former President Donald Trump is expected to be arraigned Tuesday in New York on charges related to hush money payments. And his campaign says Trump will have something to say about it Tuesday evening when he returns home to Florida. CTV's Richard Madden reports. High security at the Manhattan courthouse, bracing for the historic and unprecedented arraignment of former President Donald Trump on Tuesday, where he's expected to turn himself in as a criminal defendant. He's gearing up for a, a battle. Um, you know, this is something that obviously we believe is a political persecution. Look, Tuesday's just the beginning. Trump is expected to fly into New York from Florida Monday night, stay at his former residence at Trump Tower. Then on Tuesday morning, his motorcade will travel to the lower Manhattan criminal courthouse. He'll be fingerprinted, but it's unclear if he'll be handcuffed or get a mugshot. His former attorney general says Trump should avoid testifying at all costs. Generally, I think it's a bad idea to go on the stand, and I think it's particularly a bad idea for Trump because he lacks all self-control. While the charges remain sealed for now, Trump is reportedly facing two dozen of them, linked to hush money payments to adult film star Stormy Daniels near the end of the 2016 election campaign. Paying hush money isn't a crime, but the way Trump accounted for it could be. The looming spectacle worrying some Republicans. It's going to lead to all kinds of political theater. Theater that is going to distract from addressing the issues that are incredibly important to our country right now. Without knowing what the charges are, most Republicans and Trump's presidential challengers have rallied to his defense, except one. We can't be sidetracked for a year and a half. Former Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson announcing he's joining the race to lead the Republican Party as the only anti-Trump candidate in his long shot bid. I'm going to run for president of the United States, and I'm convinced that people want leaders that appeal to the best of America and not simply appeal to our worst instincts. Trump is using his indictment as a fundraiser, and after his court appearance, he'll fly home to Mar-a-Lago, where he'll respond to his criminal charges and outline his next steps. Heather. All right, Richard Madden in Washington tonight. In Vatican City, Pope Francis led a Palm Sunday Mass to mark the start of Holy Week, just a day after leaving hospital. <laughs> Tens of thousands waved palm and olive branches in St. Peter's Square as the pontiff passed through the crowds. <laughs> Speaking in a hoarse voice at times, the 86-year-old presided over a service that lasted two hours. Despite his recent health scare, the Vatican said Francis will take part in a full array of ceremonies this week before Easter. A closely contested election race has ousted Sanna Marin as the leader of Finland four years after she took the oath as the world's youngest prime minister. The 37-year-old Social Democrat was defeated by Conservative opposition leader Pateri Orpo. With just over 20 percent of the votes, he will hold talks with other parties to form a coalition government as the Nordic country inches closer to official NATO membership. And a short and relatively uneventful election campaign in Prince Edward Island has come to an end as people get ready to go to the polls tomorrow. Health care, housing and climate change are top of mind for voters in the province. Progressive Conservative Premier Dennis King called the election about six months ahead of the fixed election date. He will be going up against the opposition Green Party. NASA and the Canadian Space Agency are set to reveal who's going up to complete a generation-defining mission to the moon's orbit. It's an historic moment for this country as a Canadian astronaut will be part of the lunar flyby. CTV's John Benavalli Rao is in Houston ahead of tomorrow's announcement. At NASA's popular museum next to the Johnson Space Center, we found the young yeah! and young at heart amped up about tomorrow's big announcement. I think it's incredible. Long time coming. It's exciting. I'm, I'm very excited about it. Just who will be among the lucky first four to take us back to the moon? A voyage that promises to be epic. 
for so many reasons, including the fact one of those astronauts will be wearing a maple leaf. This is the first time anybody who's not from the United States has left Earth orbit, ever. That's one small step for man. The last time humans went there was back in 1972, but sometime late next year or in 2025, NASA plans to send its new mega rocket and four brave souls on a trial swing around the moon. And this time, a Canadian will go along for the ride, something the U.S. president mentioned when he recently spoke to Parliament. We choose to return to the moon together. The lucky Canadian to be named on Monday will be chosen for the country's current roster of four astronauts, three of whom have never been to space, including Ontario-born Jeremy Hansen, who's been waiting to go there for 14 years. Josh Kutrick. Two others are relative newcomers, joining the Canadian Space Agency in 2017, including Jenny Sidey Gibbons, the only woman in the group. We rise together. The coming mission, called Artemis II, will build on the success Splashdown. of an uncrewed test of the Orion spacecraft last year and will pave the way for humans to land on the surface, including the first woman and person of color. Canada is getting a seat on the test flight as part of a deal to build another robotic Canada arm that will be placed on a small space station called Gateway, which will orbit the moon. Really for Canadians to say, we do big things. We are now the second nation in the world that's going to go uh, on a lunar mission. That's quite something. As for which Canadian will get the honor of going, we'll find out tomorrow morning at an event here at the Johnson Space Center. And Heather, that astronaut will surely become a household name. An exciting day. Thanks so much for this, John. And it's been a huge week for Toronto native Summer McIntosh. The 16-year-old swimmer broke two world records in the last five days at the Canadian Swimming Trials. And another Canadian swimmer is also catching eyes and defying the odds. CTV's Vanessa Lee with that story. In the pool, Felix Cowan is all power. You would never know anything is holding him back. Some days um, my legs are really um, impacted. Some days they're feeling fine. So that's something that you can't really plan. Have you started? Or? He was born with mild cerebral palsy, you, uh, which affects mostly his legs making endurance and coordination even more challenging. I still have a, a very weak kick, but I'd say like I'm 80% arms and 20% legs. So yeah, it's definitely harder to be as fast as people without cerebral palsy, but um, I mean, you gotta make it work. Cowan started swimming when he was nine, inspired by athletes at the London 2012 Paralympic Games. He says it was a dream to don the maple leaf at the World Championships last year, where he had a breakthrough, finishing fourth in the men's 50-meter freestyle in 27.63 seconds, a Canadian record. I missed the podium by 0 0.07 seconds, which, I mean, I should be mad, but like I wasn't even expecting to get there, so it's, it was an accomplishment in itself. He hopes his times at the Canadian trials are fast enough for him to qualify again this summer as he sets his sights on the Paris 2024 Games. The strength is really being good to perform under pressure. The Paralympics are within reach, says his coach, Paralympian Jean-Michel Lavalier, who also has cerebral palsy, refusing to let it define anyone's abilities. There's often connections that can still be made and playing with how the brain can like find ways to do the movements that you want to do. At 20 years old, this could just be the beginning for Cowan, who is showing no signs of slowing down. Vanessa Lee, CTV News, Montreal. Canadian Corey Connors won the Texas Open in San Antonio, his second career PGA victory at the same tournament he won four years ago. The cutest little fan cheering on her dad as he shot a bogey-free round today. Connor's win gives him a nice boost going into the Masters next weekend. The 31-year-old has finished in the top 10 at Augusta the past three years, tying for sixth at last year's tournament. Coming up, a deep debate over aquaculture. Which essentially involving imprisoning these highly in intelligent, sensitive, complex animals. Scientists criticize plans for the world's first octopus farm. Plus, a frightening fatal house fire in Ottawa.
one person is dead after an early morning house fire in Ottawa. It came in so, like I said, it just poured in and it came in so fast that you didn't have time to think, you didn't have time. We got out with the clothes on our back. A man in his 50s was killed while three others escaped from the basement with minor injuries. This is the third fatal fire in the nation's capital in a week. The cause of the fire is not yet known. Tonight, one of the smartest species inhabiting the marine world is at the center of a global ethical debate. Scientists are alarmed by a plan to build the world's first octopus farm. And some here in Canada are even calling for an outright ban. CTV's BC Bureau Chief Melanie Nagy reports. An octopus grabs a small video camera and plays with it while it records. The species is clever and captivating. It's also the focus of an intense debate over whether or not it should be commercially farmed. People are deeply concerned. Camille Labchuk heads Animal Justice, which has joined forces with global animal rights groups working to stop a Spanish company from opening the world's first industrial scale farm. Which essentially involving imprisoning these highly in intelligent, sensitive, complex animals in tiny enclosures to grow them to market weight so they can then be slaughtered. Currently, the soft body cephalopods are caught in the wild using pots and traps. Previous attempts to farm them haven't been successful. Biologists say their solitary nature makes them unfit for aquaculture. When you want an animal to be um, raised for farming, you want them, you want a lot of them in a relatively small place. Um, and so you can't really keep them happy together. Nueva Pescanova, the company behind the latest endeavor, claims its techniques are humane. El proyecto tiene una capacidad. One company director also says the 3,000 tons of meat produced will help meet growing demand for octopus, considered a luxury item in some countries. We don't know where an octopus farm, if it was to come to Canada, where it would start. Melissa Spears is with the BCSPCA, which is backing a petition sponsored by the Green Party's Elizabeth May. It calls for a ban on the practice and importation of farmed products. These animals are sentient, they can think, they can feel, they can experience pain. There are reports Canada's Cook Seafood is negotiating with Pescanova, but when CTV News asked about a deal, neither company would comment. Currently, there are no public proposals to build a farm in Canada. As for the Spanish one, it must clear several regulatory hurdles before opening. Melanie Nagy, CTV News, Vancouver. Still ahead, getting a new lease on life. How a unique program in BC has people training their own service dogs. A charity in Vancouver Island is teaching dogs and humans some new tricks. The program pairs those in need with dogs who need to be rescued. CTV's Gord Curvis explains. Here. There you go. She'll come here three days a week for 48 weeks to train the perfect dog. Honestly, I don't know where I'd be without this dog right now. Um, life kind of went for a bit of a whirlwind and he really helps me feel grounded. Angel Blaschek moved in October from Edmonton to Vancouver Island to take part in a program that pairs rescue dogs with humans in need. I have a lot of physical pain and so I went from, oh, I have to get up to, oh, let's go for a hike. You know, and I take him to the water and he just runs. Operation Freedom Paws operates on this five-acre facility in Fanny Bay where veterans, first responders and civilians train rescue dogs to be their service dogs. It's a non-traditional program, but we find it works really well. And by the time they're finished our training program, they're very well bonded with their dog. The cost of the animal, the food, even much of the vet bills are covered by the nonprofit charity. So it's wonderful watching these dogs blossom. All these dogs really wanted was a person to love, and they love that person. Six of the dogs are rescues out of Afghanistan, tortured and shot at by the Taliban. Andy had his ears cut off and is now getting as much love from his owner as Brianna is from him. We are definitely healing each other. He needed a person. A typical dog you can throw a ball for. Um, the moment I went to go throw a ball, he had a panic attack and bolted because he thought I was throwing something at him. 
The charity relies on donations and is once again benefiting from a fundraising calendar with images from a generous photographer. Dogs are not easy to photograph because you cannot tell them to smile when people smile, but uh, you have to capture their, the moment. You have to get a good moment in, in movement or expression. There ha cannot be any stress. The dogs and their new owners are both feeling less stress thanks to the lifelong bond they are building here. Gord Kerbis, CTV News, Fannie Bay. After the break. I was pouring my pain into the pages. A teenager's journey through mourning her mother's loss. A teenager in BC grieving the loss of her mother is drawing on her own experience to help others her age turn a page. CTV's Adam Sawatsky with her inspiring words and how to find solace in suffering. Olivia Hahn needs no pictures to remind her of how meaningful it was to share snacks, drink tea, and watch her favorite TV show with her mom, Patricia. And that was my special time with her, what I cherish the most. Because they could talk and laugh and be the best of friends. It just made you feel so happy and full of love. As opposed to when her mom was diagnosed with terminal cancer, when Olivia was too in shock to feel anything at all. And I couldn't imagine that just a few months I wouldn't have my mother anymore. Although they made the most of those months in hospital, Olivia couldn't imagine when she told her mom, I'll see you tomorrow, no. that she'd never get a chance to say goodbye. The then 15-year-old says she spent the next few months feeling lost, alone, and alienated from her peers. Not knowing anyone other than adults who have lost someone, it, it made me feel like I was different or that I was weird. While Olivia searched for resources to help, she was left feeling frustrated, her dad John says, because she couldn't find anything expressing grief from a teenager's perspective. I can't find a counselor to help you. I can't, I can't talk to you. If we can't find you a book, I don't know. I guess you're going to have to write one. While John admits he was being flippant, Olivia, despite having never written regularly before, started doing just that. I was like, I was pouring my pain into the pages. Instead of writing from a clinical distance, Olivia found the courage to express being in the midst of mourning. I wanted to write something that could help me through it, but also help hopefully other people. A year later, the 16-year-old has published Healing Our Wounded Hearts. Her dad couldn't be more proud. She just started finding this, this confidence and this, this kind of personal power I didn't even know she had. While proceeds from her book will support local palliative care, Olivia's ultimate goal is to empower others to begin their own healing process. And that it's okay to be not okay and just know that there's another teenager out there who's gone through the same thing or similar to you and that I'm there for you. Adam Swatsky, CTV News, Saanich. An amazing young woman. That is it for us tonight. I'm Heather Wright for Sandy and all of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching. Omar Satchadina is here Monday. Have a good night and a great week ahead.